Well, as I said earlier, today we're going to be looking at a parable known as the parable of the great feast or the great banquet. And it's found in Luke chapter 14. Before we read it, though, I want to spend a little bit of time in an extended introduction helping paint the picture of the scene because I think it matters a whole lot in us rightly hearing this parable. So this story is recorded in Luke chapter 14. It's a little bit further down in Luke 14, starting in verse 15. And what happens at the beginning of Luke 14 is the writer tells us that Jesus was invited to have dinner at the home of a prominent Pharisee. Now, if you're familiar with the gospel stories, you you may know that's a bit of an unusual mixture because the Pharisees were often in conflict with Jesus. In fact, uh, there were a couple of major movements and schools of thought in the first century among the Jewish people. One of them was the Pharisees. Another was the Sadducees. They're fairly common characters in the gospel stories. The Sadducees were kind of centered at the temple in Jerusalem. They were the center of religious and political power there. But the Pharisees were more spread out around the countryside, and they were the ones who were probably most influential in the lives of everyday people and those who are mostly at odds with Jesus as the gospel stories unfold. So Jesus is invited to eat at the home of a prominent Pharisee. Now, as we often do in worship contexts like this, we take smaller stories or chunks of Scripture, which is fine. But if we were reading Luke from beginning to end, we would know this is not the first time Jesus has been invited to eat at the home of a Pharisee. As a matter of fact, it's the third time. And let's just say the other two times it did not end well. It didn't go super sweet. He made more enemies than friends. The first occasion was back in Luke chapter 7 when Jesus is invited to eat at the home of a Pharisee named Simon. And while he's there, they are reclining at table, which means they lean on one arm, put their feet sort of off away from a lower table and eat with their other hand. And as this meal is unfolding, this woman walks in who has a very shameful reputation in that town. And our imagination can fill in the gaps as to why that may be. And yet this very tender scene unfolds where Jesus is sitting there and his feet are extended and the woman walks in and she just begins to weep at his feet and her tears wet his feet and she wipes them then with her hair and and it's this tender moment of mercy between them. But the, the Pharisees and others at the party are not pleased with this. Matter of fact, one of them says to himself, if this man, Jesus, were actually a prophet, a man from God, he would know what kind of woman this is. Meaning he wouldn't let her this near her because... Uh, near him because he would know that she's a sinner. In fact, Jesus did know that about her and knew their thoughts. And so he said, Simon, I have a story for you. A man lent money to two people, one 500 pieces of silver, one 50. Neither could repay, so the man forgave the debt of both. Now, which one do you think would love him more? And Simon said, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. And he says, that's right. Yeah. And this woman loves much because she has been forgiven much. And again, The Pharisees and others at the table did not like that. First of all, because it was scandalous that he would offer mercy to her. But what's more is that he had the audacity to claim he could forgive sin. The next time Jesus is invited to a home of a Pharisee to eat is in Luke chapter 11. And this time as he sits down to eat, he doesn't follow their traditions of ceremonially washing their hands in a pious act showing how religious and holy they were. But instead just started eating. And this wasn't a law of God. It was a tradition that they cherished. And so when he didn't do it, when he broke their traditions, they were amazed. They said, how is it that you sit down to eat and you don't even wash your hands like we do? And he said, you Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and all kinds of ugly, evil things. And a matter of fact, you're like, you're like unmarked graves that people walk over thinking it's harmless, but it's actually deadly and dangerous. And then there's another group of people called the scribes who were experts in the law. They could draft legal documents. They were often kind of closely connected to Pharisees. There were some of them there too. And they said, teacher, do you know you offend us when you say these things? And he said, and you scribes, you weigh people down with heavy burdens. You never lift a finger to help them. You don't enter the kingdom of God. In fact, you even keep others from entering the kingdom. And you're just as bad as the Pharisees, he essentially says. And together then... After that dinner, it says they began to lie in wait, watching for an opportunity to trap him so that they might get rid of him. So as we come to this story in Luke 14, if we've been reading the whole time, we know that this occasion of Jesus being invited to the home of a Pharisee is not the first time. And based on how it went before, he's invited in order to trap him, not to honor him. Because he's been doing something else that makes them mad. They had 
taken what had been a gift, that is the Sabbath day of rest that God intended to give as a relief so that people could stop once a week, celebrate the work that they had done, rest from their work so that they could recognize that as image bearers of God, they are loved not for what they do, but for who they are. And the Pharisees had turned that gift into something that was more work than work by piling laws on top of laws on top of traditions around it, stopping people even from doing good on the Sabbath. And so several times Jesus has actually healed someone on the Sabbath and they hated him for it. So when this scene unfolds, at the beginning of Luke 14, it says he was invited to the home of a prominent Pharisee and it was a Sabbath. And the first thing that happens is there's a man who has swollen arms and legs who's incapacitated. And in his usual loving and courageous way, Jesus extends mercy and he heals him. And this time it doesn't say it, but if we've been paying attention to this story, we know they hated him for it. But then he goes further. The people are jockeying for position, trying to find the best seats of honor. And he tells them that they shouldn't do that because someone more important may have been invited and then they'll be asked to take the lesser seat and they'll be humiliated. Uh, and said they should take the lesser seat first and then they could be honored as they're invited forward. And then he gives this refrain that's often coming with his kingdom message that the first shall be last, the last shall be first, reminding us that in this kingdom that he is announcing and bringing, it often shifts our way of the world upside down. And then he tells this Pharisee who's hosting the party how he should actually throw a feast, which is not inviting people that he can impress and who can pay him back, but instead he should invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind so that he will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And in response to that, one of the guests, in a sort of a pious way, says, oh, how great it will be to feast someday in the kingdom of God. And that is the occasion for Jesus giving this parable. And all that background kind of matters because he's an honored guest, but really he's trying to be trapped. And he's giving a parable about a feast while he's at a feast after he's told them how to give feasts and someone made a comment about a feast. So there's like layer on top of layer that brings us to this powerful and very challenging parable. So would you stand please as I read from Luke chapter 14 starting in verse 15 and you simply can look at the screen at an artist's rendition of this feast. Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied with this story, a man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell his guests, Come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I now have a wife, so I can't come. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, Go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, there's still more room. So his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you can find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. My friends, this is God's word to us today. Thanks be to God. God, as always, thank you for your word. And as always, we ask that you would help us be yielded to its comfort or its correction and confrontation in whatever way you see fit. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, as I said, the occasion for Jesus giving this parable was this guest's pious comment about what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. I want to talk just for a minute about that phrase, the kingdom of God, because it is the central theme of the gospel stories and of Jesus' ministry. In the original language of the New Testament, Greek, the word that gets translated here, kingdom, is the word basileia. And it could also be translated as rule or reign. So when we hear the kingdom of God, we can hear that the rule of God, the reign of God, and then fill in the blanks after that. Well, this kingdom, reign, or rule of God was the ultimate hope of the Jewish people, which of course includes Jesus as the fulfillment of that. The hope was that God would come in person, to act with finality in the world. Dealing with sin and evil by forgiving sin and judging evil, including those who refuse to turn from evil. And part and parcel with all of that was the uplifting of the poor and the vulnerable and the mistreated. 
Ultimately, this kingdom would be a setting right of things in the world. The renewal of all creation, restoring it to the way that God initially intended before sin entered the story and wrecked things. And Jesus makes clear from the beginning that he is doing exactly that. Matter of fact, in Luke chapter 4, after Jesus' baptism and temptation in the wilderness, he starts to publicly teach, preach, and heal, proclaiming the kingdom of God. And the first day, he's at his home synagogue in the town of Nazareth, and he quotes from the prophet Isaiah. He reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And as the story unfolds, that's exactly what he does, which is why when he says how a feast should be thrown, you should invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. That's what he's been doing. So he makes it clear that that is what he's doing, is announcing and bringing this rule, reign, or kingdom of God. Now, stepping back from the text for a second, those of us who live now in the time in history after the death and resurrection of Jesus, but still before and waiting for the return of Jesus where the fullness of the kingdom will come, when all things will fully and finally be set right and death will be no more, all of that, we live with this tension where the kingdom, the rule of God, is already here because Jesus brought it. And yet it's not yet fully here because that is something we understand that will happen when Jesus returns. But this is clear. Jesus and the gospel writers make it clear that through Jesus, the rule of God is a reality now announced And people of all sorts are invited in. People who were cast off as sinners or cursed or far off from God are all welcomed in. But also, as we've already seen, the very people here at the banquet are the sorts who have rejected Jesus' reign and rule. And that brings us to the parable. Now, I don't know how you often imagine Jesus when he's teaching or giving a parable, but I invite you just to pause and think about that for a second. What sort of tone of voice what mannerisms, what facial expression, those sorts of things. Do you imagine when Jesus is teaching? Because we all have to fill in those gaps. For me, I think my tendency is to imagine him as being like this stately, stoic, sage, very serious, in a robe, uttering platitudes that appeal to religious and educated folks. But based on the Bible, based on the gospel stories, that must not quite be true. Because the sorts of crowds that flock to him are ordinary people, people who have been cast out, people who are uneducated and who are not among the religious leaders of the day. So what I think that means, among a few other things, is we have to recognize he's brilliantly insightful, but also a great storyteller, including, I think, much more funny than we usually give him credit for. I can imagine he probably told jokes more often than we usually think of, as we maybe, not just me, but maybe others, naturally imagine him. It may even make us a bit uncomfortable to think about him making jokes, such as what I believe he does in this story. But first, let me tell you how these banquets would work in those days. In those days, um, when you were preparing a big feast like this, the host would first send out invitations days or weeks ahead of time, seeing if people would come. And then, when the time came, the actual day of the feast, oftentimes, all the preparations had been made, say noon on whatever day, They would then say, tonight's the night the party's happening. They would send a servant to tell the people who had already said that they would come that tonight's the night, drop everything and come that day. So essentially, again, it's like you told me a few weeks ago you were going to come. This is the day. It's happening at five. Please show up. So Jesus tells a parable where it starts with this is the setting. And then he sends his servant out to say that the feast is now ready. But they begin making excuses. He goes to the first one and he says, "Uh, I'm sorry, I've just bought a field. I have to go check it out please excuse me. He says the second one. Uh, The second one says, I'm sorry, I just bought five yoke of oxen. I have to go try them out. Please excuse me. The third one says, "Uh, I just got married. I'm sorry, I can't come to that party. Now, like I said, we may be a little bit uncomfortable. It may offend our pious sensibilities to imagine Jesus making a joke, maybe perhaps of that nature. I don't think that necessarily needs to be true. Uh, I think in a lighthearted way, referencing the pleasure between a husband and wife in marriage is not objectifying nor crude. And in fact, the book of Song of Solomon in the Old Testament is entirely devoted to it. But I do believe, as one of my rules is to be faithful to the text, I believe that's faithful to the text. And I believe it's an act of mercy. Because I believe Jesus is in love one last time trying to break the ice that these folks at the banquet may hear a word that they don't want to hear and that they've been rejecting. 
which is what the rest of the story is all about. That the initial people invited, that is them, had better things to do. And so the invitation went out to everyone everywhere who were coming in, and they were the very people that they thought were cast off. That is, the people who initially thought they were in, the people they thought were cast off, are now invited in, while they don't even get a taste of the party. See, what he's saying is, Jesus is the fulfillment of all those hopes that they say they long for. He's the feast of the kingdom of God in person, and they've rejected it. They've rejected him, so they've rejected it. And that is really the point. The point is, he's telling these people at this feast that the feast you say you're longing for is literally sitting right across the table from you. But you've already made it clear you've got better things to do. And you've rejected the very thing you say you're longing for. See, in this parable, God is the one who throws the banquet. Jesus is the very embodiment of the banquet in human form. All of the goodness and grace of God coming to us in person and opening up the life of God to us, eventually through his own death. His death that sets us free from the powers of darkness, sets us free from sin and death itself. His resurrection that defeats death and gives us hope for all eternity that death doesn't have the final word, restoring to us our identity as beloved children of God the Father, no matter who we are or what we've done. Restoring to us order where otherwise chaos and confusion reigned in our lives. Giving us a purpose to be co-laborers with God in the remaking, in the healing of his world through this gospel. And again, yes, giving us a hope that death is not something we need bow in fear to. It is not the end, it is not the king, and it does not have the final word. All of that is what Jesus invites us into through his reign, kicked off through his own death and resurrection. And in this parable, the banquet like this kingdom of God, is scandalously open to all, everywhere, even those who were written off or who had written themselves off. People also from every tribe, tongue, and nation, which is evidenced by it's not just in the town. Eventually, it's the highways and the byways that the servants are sent out to invite people in from. And the irony is that the most religious and self-assured are the very ones who will not get a taste. I mean, this parable is good news. No matter who you are, where you're from, what you've done, you are invited in. The only disqualification is a refusal to take part. Whether that refusal is through the direct rejection of a self-righteous hard heart or the less direct but no less real refusal of a self-sufficient preoccupation with some other vision for life such that you're not willing to bring your life under the kingdom vision of Jesus and putting your life towards his purposes. Simply put, the only disqualification is to refuse to take part, to refuse to surrender our life to his care and leadership. Which brings me to the call to action in closing. As you've been saying in this series, all these parables are meant to make us aware of a new reality, but then to call us to some sort of action, to live differently based on the reality that's been made known to us. First, I believe I'd be remiss if I didn't point out what I believe is the heart and soul of this parable, which is a warning that it is possible that we miss God's reconciling and healing work in the world even if we are church folk, even if we are near often to the message about Jesus. Because being part of a church, even for many days, weeks, or years, is not the same as saying yes to the invitation of Jesus personally. Again, simply surrendering our life to his care and leadership. Second, this parable makes clear I believe that the outcasts who are unexpected and did not get the memo the first time can and does include us. Sometimes our lives are weighed down by heavy guilt and shame and regret of things from our past, things and labels and and identities forced onto us by others. And even if we count ourselves out of such a party, the invitation is extended even to the likes of us no matter who we are, where we've been, or what we've done. And lastly, the call to action is this. This parable makes it clear that the invitation is extended to all. So um, I think we should do that. I think we should extend the invitation to all. I mean, perhaps for some of us, there's someone in our life who we're estranged from. Or perhaps there's someone that we know as a bit of an outlier or on the margins, whether that be in our schools 
or in our families, or in our friend groups, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, and we can extend the hand of friendship, maybe a knuckle bump during COVID times yet, but extend the offer of friendship to a person as an expression of love and mercy as we have received. But what's more, we ought to extend the invitation to be a part of God's family, even to those around us who we may have written off or we may have never been able to speak to about those things before, inviting them to a place like this to worship as part of an ongoing conversation about the things of God, whether before or after an invitation to a place like this. Either way, I believe it is part of the call to action that we extend the invitation to be part of that family, imaged in a feast from people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, from all sorts of backgrounds. We extend that invitation to the people in our lives. That's part of the power and the beauty of this parable. Let's pray together. God, I am so thankful for this story, the wonderful good news that it contains. Lord, I ask again that you, by the power of your spirit, would do what my words never could, which is for those who perhaps can't help but think that this seems like news that is too good to be true, that you would overwhelm them with its reality, that it is true, that it is good news, but that it is true, even if they don't otherwise believe it that your Holy Spirit would soften hearts, that the invitation extended would be received gladly and humbly, and then with gratitude for the love you have given to us, we would also, in turn, extend that invitation to others. And on and on it goes, and fuller and fuller your house and family become. May that be so, and may we take our part in it. In Jesus' name, amen.